The notion of a solid body is fundamental to the understanding of dynamics. To begin with, we can consider uh, a collection of point masses that are interconnected by massless rods. Um, so this is a body which can move in space and it can reorient. Um, and um, in, in fact, to describe the dynamics of, uh, of a body of this sort, we're not actually going to need a detailed description of how the, uh, the, the, the mass is, is configured in the system. Ultimately, we're only going to need um, three quantities uh, regarding the aggregate mass properties of a body of this sort. The first is the total mass, so it's the sum of all of the individual masses in the body. Uh, the next is the vector to the center of mass, and so if we have some body um, and uh, we take the mass weighted radius um, from some um, center of some coordinate system, some right-handed coordinate system, um, to, uh, to, to the um, points on the body normalized by the total mass, um, then we get uh, a vector to the center of mass from some reference coordinate system, and so that's called the, uh, the location of the center of mass. Um, and the third thing that we um, can calculate is something called the inertial tensor. So we we're going to show in a later lecture um, that the dynamics depend on the total mass, the location of the center of mass, um, and um, the distribution of the mass as summarized um, uh, by um, this inertial tensor. So it's defined in, uh, in index form here. Uh, perhaps it's most easily understood if we write out, it's a three by three symmetric matrix, we can write out its individual components in this form. Uh, on the main diagonal we have m y squared plus z squared summed over each of the masses, um, m x squared plus z squared and m x squared plus y squared, and we have these off-diagonal terms. By construction, this matrix is symmetric and positive semi-definite, so all of its eigenvalues are greater than or equal to zero. Um, and um, According to this definition, if we shift our center of mass a little bit um, and we recalculate the inertial tensor, uh, then the original calculation and the new calculation of the inertial tensor will be related um, via this formula, so via a simple function of the shift vector s. Also, if we calculate the inertial tensor in some convenient coordinate system, so say our body is originally formed by a bunch of cubes that are bolted together, there will be a convenient coordinate system that we can calculate um, these uh, these sums um, and uh, and and so if we start with I calculated in some convenient coordinate system I might not work out to be a diagonal matrix um, and but we can always if we start off with a symmetric positive definite matrix of this sort um, we can always um, convert to a new coordinate system where I is diagonal and so we can accomplish that via an eigen decomposition so we calculate the eigenvalues and, and corresponding eigenvalues vectors um, of our original calculation of I, and in this new coordinate system called the principal axes of the body, which are defined by those three directions given by the three columns of the S matrix, the eigenvectors of, of I, um, in this new coordinate system, the I matrix, if we, uh, the, the inertial tensor, if we recalculate it, will be diagonal, um, and we can order it in such a way that um, I1 is greater than I2 is greater than an I3, I1, I2, and I3, so the, um, the diagonal components of the inertial tensor when it's oriented and so it's, um, the inertial tensor is diagonal, these are called the principal moments of inertia. So I1 and I2 and I3 are the principal moments, uh, moments of inertia. We arrange them in descending order um, and uh, they are, uh, they're all um, greater than or equal to zero. Um, and uh, by these definitions, if we convert to a coordinate system where the off-diagonal components are zero, it's easy to see from this that I2, uh, I1 is less than or equal to I2 plus I3. Um, and so uh, there are only four possibilities um, of, uh, of, of how um, I1, I2, and I3 can work out. So you might start from a complicated body, but in the end, um, I1, I2, and I3 might be equal to each other. Uh, and if they are, uh, so, so from the perspective of looking at I, if the, the mass distribution is symmetric, we call that a spherical top. A special case of a spherical top, of course, is like a basketball, um, but other cases are, are possible as well. Um, 
The, uh, the, the next possibility that we might look at is that I1 equals I2, but they're both larger than I3. Um, and so that corresponds to an elongated symmetric top. Um, and so, um, again, it might come from some more complex distribution of, uh, of parts that are bolted together. Uh, but in the end, um, uh, it has the same sort of mass distribution as an American football, uh, so something which is elongated um, and, uh, and has um, a, a, a longer direction and, and two shorter directions. Um, and so when visualizing um, how a body like this might move, you might think of a, an American football. Um, you can take the limiting case where you have all the points lined up in just a line. And so it's the collinear case with R1 and R2 equal to zero for each mass along the body so that it only varies in, in the three direction. Um, and so um, in this special case called a rotator, um, we have I3 is equal to zero. Um, two more cases. One is the flattened symmetric top, and so if we have I1 greater than I2 equals I3, um, that's instead of being like a football, it's a smashed ball, so you might think of like a, uh, a frisbee, so it's symmetric in two of the directions, but it's flattened in the third direction. Um, or it might be uh, a general mass distribution, um, which has all three of these uh, principal components of inertia um, different from each other, um, and that might be um, like, say, this box, um, or like a cell phone, um, and so that's the uh, uh, sometimes referred to as an asymmetric top. Um, the limiting case of um, C and D, um, where the uh, all of the points in the mass are idealized as lying in a plane, the coplanar case, um, say one is the, the direction normal to that plane, so R1 is equal to zero. Um, so in that limiting case where you've taken the frisbee and smashed it all the way flat. So you have a flattened symmetric top where R1 is equal to zero for all points. Or you have an asymmetric uh, uh, top and you've flattened it in the R1 direction. Um, and uh, so in either of those limiting cases, we have I1 is equal to I2 plus I3. In the first case, I2 and I3 are going to be equal to each other. In the second case, I2 and I3 are still going to be different from each other. Um, but if it's coplanar, then I1 equals I2 plus I3. If it's not coplanar, um, then I uh, I1 is less than I2 plus I3. So those are the possibilities of the, uh, of the inertial tensor that we can consider for various bodies. Um, and as we derive the equations of motion of a body, we'll come back and use these properties. But now I want to move to how do we describe the um, configuration of a body in, uh, in space. So space is three-dimensional. Um, the location of the body um, can be described by a vector in R3, the vector to the center of mass here. So the location um, is defined by three degrees of freedom. And the um, orientation and so three degrees of freedom for the location is straightforward. R just has three components. Um, the orientation is a lot more subtle to describe, and we'll spend the next three videos actually discussing how to describe the orientation of a solid body. Um, but the orientation um, is defined by three degrees of freedom as well, it turns out. And that's going to take some effort to show. Um, so in total, the um, configuration of the body um, is defined by six degrees of freedom. Three to describe where it is in space, um, and three to describe the orientation of the body in space. Um, and so how do we consider um, the problem of orientation? Well, we start from some reference orientation. Um, and so we'll start uh, by saying if the body started with its x-coordinate, say, facing north, um, its, um, its y-coordinate um, facing east, and its z-coordinate facing down, um, then that would be uh, the um, north X, Y, Z, the north, east, down reference orientation, um, which is used in, uh, in aerospace. Um, and it's also used for automobiles by the um, SAE standard. 
Um, and uh, so that's one reference orientation that the, uh, you, you might say, okay, let's start with our body there and then let's rotate it to some other orientation. There's another commonly used reference orientation is um, east, north, up um, reference orientation. Um, and uh, that's used by the ISO standard. Um, so depending upon uh, which standard your industry uses, um, you might start from one or the other of these reference orientations. Um, and then the final um, orientation of the body is, is going to be described by some rotation from one of these reference orientations. So uh, the orientation of the body, uh, the orient um, of body described um, as a rotation um, from the reference condition um, from reference orientation. So, uh, so the, the question boils down to how do we describe a rotation? Um, and a rotation is described uh, by a rotation matrix R. Um, and so, uh, so if we have some point P, uh, maybe it's a vector from the center of mass to some point on the body. Um, and we want to say um, if P is this direction before the rotation, where is it after the rotation? Um, and we can do that um, for any and all points uh, on the body. So we start from any vector P and we can define how we, uh, uh, we, we can define the final location, the, the, the final orientation of the body through a rotation matrix R. Um, and so a special case um, of, uh, of so, so R is called the rotation matrix. And that's what we need to describe a rotation. It's an orthogonal matrix um, that can be used to transform um, any vector P um, from its, uh, its original location to its location after the, the orientation. A special case um, is uh, of a rotation matrix um, is the Givens rotation matrix. And a, a Givens rotation matrix um, is simply um, a rotation in a coordinate plane, so 2D rotation. Um, and so it can be defined with a cosine and a sine. Um, and that's going to be embedded into an identity matrix. So you have um, C, S, minus S, C embedded into an identity matrix. So the rest of it is identity, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Um, and uh, where C is equal to the cosine of some angle and S is equal to the sine of some angle, uh, the angle about which you rotate. And so that is how you can describe a rotation in the 1-2 plane of some body in 3 space. And so nothing happens in the third direction uh, and the body is just rotated in the 1-2 plane by an amount theta is defined by the Givens rotation matrix. But we want in general to describe a general rotation. So a general rotation um, is given by, um, uh, so, so the rotation matrix R is orthogonal. So it's some matrix, some three by three rotation matrix R, which is an orthogonal matrix. Um, and so that means um, R times R transpose is equal to I. And so um, R in general has, um, has nine degrees of freedom, but if we restrict it um, so that R times R transpose is equal to I. Well, R times R transpose by construction is symmetric, right? So the strictly upper triangular parts of this product equal the strictly lower triangular parts. But if we set that equal to I, we're going to get three 
equations on the main diagonal, so the, the main diagonal of the stuff on the left is equal to, uh, to, to, to 1, and um, the subdiagonal components of the thing on the left is equal to 0 um, if it's equal to i, because i is 1's on the main diagonal and 0's below. Um, by construction, if we get 0's on the um, subdiagonal components, we'll also have 0's on the superdiagonal components. Um, and so we have six constraints, uh, six constraints on, uh, on the nine parameters that define R, the, the nine components of R, on the nine components of R. Um, so in other words, we have, uh, within R, we have three degrees of freedom, which is, as I stated previously, the orientation is defined by rotation, the rotation is defined by a rotation matrix R, R is orthogonal, and since it's orthogonal, then we have uh, um, six constraints on R, which gives us a total of three degrees of freedom to describe the rotation. Okay. Um, one other thing about R, um, so if we have R times R transpose is equal to I, we take the determinant of that, so we have the determinant um, of R times the determinant of R transpose um, is equal to I, there are two possibilities. The determinant of R transpose is just equal to the determinant of R. So the determinant of R um, is equal to um, plus or minus one um, in order for this to work out. Um, we're interested in the case um, pure rotation um, is given by the case with, uh, with the determinant of R equal to 1. Uh, the case with um, the term of r equals negative 1 corresponds to a rotation and a reflection of the body through itself, and we can't do that when we're, when we're rotating, so that's called an improper rotation. So we're interested in r uh, of the two possibilities here. We're interested in those cases um, that have uh, the term of r equal to 1, so that's a little bit of a further restriction uh, on, on what the, the possible r's can be. But in general, there are three degrees of freedom restricted so that we want the uh, determined to be positive one, not negative one. Okay, so uh, so that is the notion of the rotation matrix. The challenge is it's difficult to visualize what's actually happening to the body with the three degrees of freedom that uh, that you can uh, l be left with um, in, uh, in R. So we can't work solely with R. We need some other way to describe a rotation that we can convert to R and so we can apply a rotation. So we need three other ways to think about, uh, how we, we need convenient other ways to, to think about rotation. So three ways um, that we'll uh, consider in the following three videos. Three ways to consider rotation. So, so consider the development of R. Um, one is via uh, something called Rodriguez's Rodriguez's um, rotation formula. Um, one is, uh, is called rotation via unit quaternions. And the third is um, via a sequence of rotation about the principal axes of the, of the vehicle. So we have uh, two possible choices there. One is called an Euler rotation sequence, um, and one is called a um, Tate-Bryan rotation sequence. And so um, each of these is going to take some work to develop, so I'll have uh, one video for each of these ways to consider R. Rodriguez's rotation formula um, is simply that uh, the statement that any rotation can be considered um, as a rotation about some rotation axis um, of your solid body 
around a certain number of degrees theta about that axis. And so the axis is defined by some unit vector, and the amount of rotation is defined by some scalar theta, how much you rotate. And so if you take that unit vector and you scale it by theta, then that vector scaled by theta is some vector in R3, it has three degrees of freedom. So defining how something turns via Rodriguez's rotation formula um, is a unit vector scaled by theta, the amount you turn by, again has three degrees of freedom to describe the orientation. So we'll discuss that formula um, and uh, the related notion that R can be described uh, as the rotation of a body um, about um, some, vec some unit vector by a certain number of degrees. That statement is, uh, is, is called Euler's Rotation Theorem. So we'll discuss that in the first video. Uh, the second video will introduce the notion of a quaternion. So a quaternion is a generalization of a complex number, um, and that gives us a very convenient way to express Rodriguez's rotation formula in terms of the mathematics, which is very useful um, and, uh, and, and very powerful, um, can be used to express multiple rotations, combine them together, uh, in a way which is not singular and very convenient. Um, the third uh, video will discuss Euler and Tate-Bryan rotation sequences. Um, and uh, so an Euler rotation sequence, an example of it, um, is the, uh, um, the 313 um, Euler rotation sequence. Um, is, uh, um, say, take your vehicle, yaw it around the, its z-axis, roll it around its x-axis, and then yaw it again around its z-axis. That gets you to some final, uh, final orientation. So it's three distinct rotations around one of the principal axes of the vehicle, around another principal axis of the vehicle, and then around the principal axis that you rotated about the, the first time. That's um, called an Euler rotation sequence. So you could select any of the three here, you could select any of the remaining two there, and so there's six possibilities um, for the Euler rotation sequence, and a commonly used one is the 313 Euler rotation sequence. So we'll um, consider that case in particular. Um, a Tate-Bryan rotation sequence is slightly different, um, the example that we will consider is a 3, 2, 1 rotation sequence. So again, we're rotating about principal axes of the body. Um, and uh, so in the, uh, but, but the last one is taken um, as uh, the, the one that you haven't done with. So we'll rotate around one of the principal axes of the body. We'll rotate around um, a different principal axis of the body, and then the third rotation will be a rotation about the remaining principal axis of the body. So again, there are six possibilities here, um, and we'll consider the special case of the 3 to one tate brown rotation sequence. Um, and so that case corresponds to um, first yawing the body um, about its uh, z-axis, um, and then pitching the body um, about its y-axis, and then rolling the body about its x-axis. And so that's an example of a Tate-Bryan rotation sequence. Um, and so either of these sequences of rotations um, can get you to any final configuration. Um, similarly to uh, uh, using Rodriguez's rotation formula, um, just taking any axis um, and rotating about some theta can get you to any final orientation of the body, and that Rodriguez's rotation formula is well expressed using unit criterion, quaternions. So we can relate all of these formula and how they um, give us a corresponding rotation matrix R, which can describe the orientation of the body, um, and then we can move forward from there to discuss the dynamics of the body as it moves in time. So that's the challenge of where we're going to go next um, in the subsequent videos.